There we go. So in the four weeks leading up to Christmas, the church around the world traditionally celebrates the season of Advent and the four great themes that surround the birth of Jesus. Hope, peace, joy, and love. Last week we read Luke's account of the event of the first Christmas night, and this week week we're going to read it again because it's this um, passage from Luke's Gospel that highlights two of the great themes, um, the themes of peace, which we looked at last week, and the theme of joy, which we're looking at um, this week. So in Luke chapter 2, beginning at verse 8, after uh, Mary had given birth to Jesus in that region, there were shepherds living in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. Then an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for see, I am bringing you good news of great joy for all the people. To you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign for you. You will find a child wrapped in bands of cloth and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth peace among those whom he favors. When the angels had left and gone into the heavens, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go down to Bethlehem and see this thing that has taken place which the Lord has made known to us. So they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the child lying in the manger. When they saw this, they made known what had been told them about this child, and all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured all these words and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen, as had been told to them. <clears throat> so we've already um, started to think uh, this morning about um, what, it, what joy means and the difference perhaps between um, happiness um, and joy. Now in terms of the Greek New Testament, um, there are 19 different words that are used for happiness and joy. And so there's no real way to get a definition of what happiness is and joy is. It all depends on the context in which it is, the word is used. And I want to suggest this morning that one of the main contextual differences between joy and happiness is that happiness is often about the, um, um, the feeling that arises when a particular situation goes well for us. But I want to suggest that joy is something that is deeper than that, and that joy is related to the relationships that we have. So the difference between joy and happiness is not so much the feeling of the feeling, but the source of the feeling. Now, it has been said by some that money can't buy you happiness, but it kind of can. I mean, money can buy you the kind of situations that can make you happy for a moment. What money can't buy you is ongoing joy, because joy is something that lasts beyond the moment. What joy comes from is the relationships that we have and that uh, are, are so much part of who we are. But particularly uh, in the context that we're looking at this morning in terms of our um, relationship with God. So in terms of the Christmas season, it's possible that um, the things of Christmas can make you happy um, for a moment, the um, happiness of the kids uh, opening their presents, happiness around the tree, happiness of um, the various um, um, traditions that we have around Christmas, but that the actual experience of joy comes from something deeper than that, something that comes from the consistent relationship that is open to us at this Christmas season. 
Uh, in um, Paul's letter to the Galatians, he talks about the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, uh, and um, uh, he's got a list of nine there. But the first two, love and joy, particularly I think is important this morning. The fruit of the Spirit is a metaphor. It's a metaphor for the inevitable outcome of being in relationship with the Spirit of God. So if we are in relationship with the Spirit of God, the natural outcome of that will be love, will be joy. It is uh, 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 joy comes from that sense of relationship and ongoing experience, not just something in the moment. So the angels um, came and sang um, um, of the good news of great joy that was to all um, people. In Luke's gospel, the context of joy is the good news of salvation, the good news that God has made way for people to be restored to in relationship of him. We hear of joy and rejoicing at the good news of God's salvation repeatedly in Luke, but most significantly at the time of Jesus' birth, in Jesus' great parables of salvation in chapter 15, in Jesus' ethical teachings of God's blessings in chapter 6, and in the final chapter of Luke's gospel after the disciples come to grips with the significance of Jesus' resurrection. So in Luke's gospel, and Luke's gospel is my favorite. I mean, I don't know if the gospels are such that you're not meant to have a favorite, but Luke is definitely my favorite because it's the best one. You might have other ones, but I don't know why you would do that. But all right, so Luke, Luke, the reason Luke is a great gospel is because it begins and it ends and in the middle, it's about joy. It's about the joy of knowing God. A dominant theme of Luke's gospel is caught up in this very message of the angel, good news of great joy. Uh, uh, Francois uh, Buffon, a looking scholar, says that joy is for Luke, a characteristic of faith, of relationship with God, that recognizes that salvation history is marching forward. Luke attacks its great importance to this joy, which is personal and communal. It is the marching forth of the story of God that Luke sees as um, coming together in the birth of Jesus and the uh, opening up from that, that is the good news of great joy. The Bible can be read as a story that has a beginning and an end and stuff in the middle. The beginning is the time of creation, the time in which God makes people in his own image, people who are able to relate to him. And he walks with them in the garden. But, but that relationship is broken. And we are, um, uh, we are estranged from God. We are unable to be in that relationship with God. But the good news of great joy is that by the end of the story, we are in relationship with God again. God comes and dwells in the midst of his people. So it begins with in relationship with God. It ends with relationship with God. And the story is about how that is lost for a time and then recovered um, through Jesus. So the fall separates us. We uh, lose that relationship with God, that closeness to God. And it is Jesus who comes in the middle of the story to change that and to make it possible for us to find our way home. So this good news of great joy is for all the people. The good news that we who have been separated from God can come back and enter into relationship with God is for all the people. The Christmas story is filled with people who normally would be overlooked 
by any good news of great joy. Mary and Joseph were an embarrassment to their family. The situation that they had got themselves into was such that um, the people of the local village of um, um, Nazareth would have been um, horrified at what was going on with them. But this good news is for all people, including those who have become, for some reason, an embarrassment to their families. Elizabeth and Zachariah, uh, who are also in the Christmas story, um, have, uh, have been for many years uh, unable to conceive a child. And in their context, they were identified by their neighbors and their friends as God-forsaken, people that God had not blessed, and people who were outside of that area of God's blessing. But the good news of the Christmas story is for all the people, including those who others think are God-forsaken. Of course, the shepherds are, the, um, are kind of the stars of... Um, Luke chapter 2 that we read. And these shepherds are um, men of uh, working in low regard jobs. If you might, uh, if you might think of a, I don't know what a high regard job is, um, CEO of a big company um, in Adelaide. <laughs> Maybe not in, but no, let's not get, um, let's not get particular. Um, uh, and so if you think of like, <clears throat> what's the tallest building in Adelaide? Yeah, so how many stores is that? Floors is that? Big? Anyway, so let's imagine that at the top is a big CEO, uh, somebody of importance, somebody that is well regarded, and perhaps the shepherds would be equivalent to the people who are cleaning the toilets down on the um, third floor. Uh, nobody notices that they're there. Nobody really wants to do their job. Everybody's kind of glad that they are there, but nobody wants to do their job. People of low regard, people who are not considered important, and yet the good news is for all people, even those who have um, employment that uh, would be considered of low regard. The Magi, the, the three wise men, the three kings from the Orient, uh, are actually not kings, and they're not wise men. They're actually priests of a foreign religion. They're astrologers. They're people that would not fit into the Jewish religious framework at all, people who are outsiders to that. These magi, these priests of a foreign religion, the good news was for all the people, including them. And as we will see as we go through Luke's gospel at another time, the good news is for tax collectors and for sinners. Tax collectors, those who are socially excluded, sinners, those who are religiously excluded. The good news is for all the people, no matter who they are. This gives me, I guess, uh, an opportunity to just jump ahead in the story to Luke chapter 15, where Jesus tells um, three great parables, and I'm certain I will get an opportunity to mention that again next year um, uh, a number of times. But in Luke chapter 15, Luke chapter 15 begins with all the, those tax collectors and sinners, those people that were, the, the good news was for all people, including them. Well, they're actually responding to Jesus. And they're coming near to listen to Jesus. And the Pharisees and the scribes, that is, religious people of well standing, of good standing and well meaning, perhaps, are saying, this fellow welcomes sinners and eats with them. And so Jesus tells um, three parables. The first one about the lost sheep. The second one about the lost coin. And the third one about the prodigal um, son. Jesus actually makes the hero of his first story the shepherd. The one who is of low regard, of low um, significance. And when, that and when the shepherd finds that lost sheep, what does he do? 
He celebrates, rejoice with me, for I have found that which was lost. When the woman who has some time, uh, ten coins and loses one of them, when she finds that coin, what does she do? She gathers her neighbors together and she says to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found that which was lost. When the lost are found in Luke's gospel, it is an occasion for a party. It is time to celebrate. God has called all people to himself. And there is nothing that makes God happier. And there is nothing that makes heaven happier. There is nothing that ought to make God's people happier than the celebration of the finding of the lost. And so um, it is astonishing that at times the only people not celebrating the finding of the lost are good, respectable church people. Um, who think that it was okay when God went looking for me because while I needed to be found, uh, God was kind of lucky to get me. But when God went looking for them, well, now he's gone too far. But the Christmas story is that there is never too far with God. God is always looking for the lost. God is always looking for those that others um, have set aside. And when God finds them, there is a time of real joy. Good news of great joy is that when we are found, there is celebration, there is joy. I tell you, Jesus says, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents, over one lost who is found. There's a German proverb um, which translated into English says something like, shared pain is half the pain. Shared joy is twice the joy. When we experience joy and we share it with one another, that joy is multiplied and grows. If we get that sense, if we get that realization that God celebrates the finding of the lost, that God makes way for the sinner to come home, that God is looking for an opportunity for all his people to be gathered together, when we know that that makes God's heart joyous, then we can join in that and celebrate that, and our joy will be multiplied. Which uh, uh, brings us an opportunity to bring together um, this Christmas uh, focus and also the baptism um, that we're about to see in, in a few minutes. When we unwrap God's Christmas gift of salvation, when we find our way home, we discover the joy of our relationship with it, our Savior, that, that one who has brought us home, but also a Savior who is both the Christ and the Lord. In uh, Luke's day, when he wrote um, um, this account of the Christmas story, the words good news, Savior, and Lord had a political meaning. They spoke about Caesar Augustus, what Caesar was able to do for the world. And so when Luke writes this, he knows that his readers um, recognize that there is this idea that Rome is the power. Rome is the one that will bring salvation to the world. But he challenges that with the good news of Jesus, that Jesus is actually um, the source of good news, salvation, and lordship. So the challenge for us as we hear this Christmas message is what side are we going to be on? Are we going to side with Rome and its understanding of power and culture and um, uh, what makes for a good life? Or are we going to side with Jesus and recognize in Jesus that our opportunity to find a relationship with God has come. 
we are invited not just to receive salvation, not just to get forgiven, but to come home, to come home to God and enter into a relationship with someone who is both Christ and Lord. Baptism captures this idea of death to the old world and coming alive to the new world. Death to a world in which Caesar is Lord and coming alive into a world in which Jesus is Christ and Lord. The joy of Christmas is not just that Neil is able to enter into baptism and receive um, and, and witness to what God has done for him and his willingness to follow after Jesus as both Christ and Lord, but the opportunity that we all get to celebrate that um, joy, to increase our sense of joy at what God has done. God has made it possible for the prodigal to come home, for the lost to be found, for anyone anyone to enter into relationship with Jesus. This is the good news of great joy. Let's join together in prayer. God, our Savior, we join with the angels in heaven and your saints across time and place to proclaim gloria, glory to the God who does not turn his back on his people, nor set himself against those who have forsaken him. Glory to the God who comforts the sorrowful, who heals the broken, who loves the loveless, who strengthens the weak, who forgives the guilty, and who brings the home the lost. We rejoice with the angels in heaven and your saints across time and place in thanksgiving for the true gift of Christmas. A saviour, Born in humiliation in occupied Bethlehem, Jesus, Son of God, Emmanuel, God with us, who is Christ, the hope of God's people, and Lord over the whole earth. We rejoice that we have nothing to recommend, that we who have nothing to recommend us are invited to that Bethlehem manger to rejoice that the hope of the world is come. We rejoice with the angels in heaven and your saints across time and place in celebrating the good news that we who were lost have been found, that we who were astray have been brought home. Thanks be to God for this unspeakable gift. We rejoice that friends and enemies, family and strangers, neighbors and people from every nation and every tongue have been found and brought home. We rejoice that their redemption and restoration to the family of God multiplies our opportunity for and our capacity for real joy. We celebrate with the angels in heaven and your saints across time and place in the great salvation party for the lost have been found. Let all who seek you rejoice and be glad in you. Let those who love your salvation say evermore, God, our Savior, is great. Amen. Let's stand for the benediction. Writing to the church in Philippi, the Apostle Paul challenged the, these early Christians with these words. Finally, my brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord. Rejoice in the Lord, I will say again, rejoice. And Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always even to the very end of the age. The Lord be with you today and forevermore. Amen.